Calvary and friends. This is Pastor Walton with this week's message. It's a blessing to be able to see you, and I hope that you and your family are doing well. The scripture that we want to talk about uh, this week is taken from 1 Peter uh, chapter 5, verses 1 through 11. And I'm not going to read that at this time, uh, but I'm going to read it a little bit later on in the message. The title of the message uh, is, this is part six of a seven, series, a seven sermon series. And so this is uh, actually, I will pray for my church leaders. I will pray for my church leaders. I skipped over uh, uh, and went to chapter five last week because it was Father's Day. And so uh, today I'm coming back and dealing with chapter four of Tom Rayner's book, I Am a Church Member. And the title again is, I Will Pray for My Church Leaders. And that's why uh, the scriptural reference is what it is, First Peter, uh, the fifth chapter, uh, verses one through 11. Let's look to God in prayer. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts together be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, our strength and our redeemer. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. My sisters and brothers, during this Kairos time, during this pandemic, uh, and also the attention to the plight of African Americans in this country, uh, brought about by the senseless murders of Ahmaud Arbery, Breonna Taylor, and George Floyd, uh, Milwaukee Journal Sentinel columnist James Causey published an article. And the title of the article is, quote, Fannie Lou Hamer's Declaration I'm sick and tired of being sick and tired is still a rallying cry for black people in Milwaukee, unquote. And then the subset of the article reads as follows. We've made little progress in Milwaukee in the decades since Fannie Lou Hamer made her impassioned plea for equal rights, unquote. Causey writes, and I quote, studies based on median income, employment, and home ownership rates have ranked Milwaukee as the worst place in the nation for African Americans to live. Home ownership is 27.8% for blacks, 68.2% for whites. The median income is less than $30,000 per year for blacks compared to more than $60,000 per year for whites. And then Wisconsin incarcerates black men at the highest rate in the nation and has the widest achievement gap between black and white students. It's hard to constantly hear these statistics. I know that it is, and it's even harder to live in the reality of these statistics, but because this is a sermon about praying for our church leaders and specifically pastors and senior pastors, imagine preaching every Sunday, every week, and seeking to pastor in this reality. It's not impossible because many of us have continued to do it for years only with God's help. If it wasn't for God, we wouldn't be able to do it. But because of God's grace, he has given us the strength to do it. Many of you have been in prayer and we give God thanks. I know every pastor is thankful for those who have prayed him or her through. I'm not, you know, saying, I'm not uh, comparing struggles or saying this or that. I'm not underestimating any other uh, saint's struggle. I am simply putting forth the argument that pastors, especially African-American pastors in the city of Milwaukee, lead in a very, very difficult place. While white supremacy and white racism and racial targeting uh, and profiling are as much a part of the state of Wisconsin as beer, cheese, and brats, the problems African Americans face in Milwaukee, and particularly the black church in Milwaukee, have been exacerbated by many things. Causey, who I do not know personally, says, and I quote, Milwaukee is a place where good ideas often go to die. We have meetings and talk, then talk some more. In the end, bureaucracy, divisiveness, 
turf battles, and a lack of public commitment reign instead of collaboration to get things done. Okay, there's always more, but I'm not going there. The article is available for anyone who would like to read it. My primary purpose in sharing this information with you has not been to be a hater nor to add to Milwaukee's problems, but to pinpoint why African-American pastors, especially in Milwaukee, need the prayers and support of the people who are in covenant with them. How can this happen? Well, this is the application section of the sermon. I'm not going to go back to what I've already covered about the need to be saved and to be in the church that the Holy Spirit sends you to. That's covered in the previous sermons inspired by this book, by this book by Tom Rayner. I am here today, right now, to talk about how you, if you are willing, can support and not detract from the kingdom work your pastor is called to do. If you don't have this book already, I am a church member. It's very, very easy to get. It was published in 2013, and you can get it on your device right away today. If this uh, is new to you and you've not listened to any of the sermons previous to this, um, uh, this is this sermon that we're in right now is a six is number six of a seven part series, and so all of the previous sermons are available, and you can listen to them on our church website or on our YouTube channel. But in this chapter, because we're in this chapter now, Rainer, who is inspired really by 1 Corinthians 12, 13, and 14, those, 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 those chapters really kind of anchor the book because those chapters specifically talk about the body of Christ. But he's also he also is talented and uses other passages of scriptures such as the one that we're using today for our focal scripture. But in the midst of all of this, he goes all the way through. But in this chapter, he makes essentially four asks of members of churches. Number one, pray for the pastor and other church leaders. That's simple enough. Pray for the pastor and other church leaders. All of them are simple, in fact, if you're willing to do them. Number two, pray for the pastor and their family. Number three, pray for the pastor's protection. And number four, pray for the pastor's physical and mental health. I could go into great depth about all of these things, but the main thing I want to do is read biblically why you should do all of this. And it is because out of all the people in your church, no matter what church you go to, the Lord Jesus Christ called and sent one person, not five, not seven, not two, but one person to be the under shepherd of that flock. Hebrews 13 and 17 says very clearly, have confidence in your leaders and submit to their authority because they keep watch over you as those who must give an account. Do this so their work will be a joy, not a burden, for that would be of no benefit to you. Allow me now to read from our sermonic text, uh, 1 Peter 5, 1 through 11. The elders who are among you I exhort, I who am a fellow elder and a witness of the sufferings of Christ and also a partaker of the glory that will be revealed, shepherd the flock of God which is among you, serving as overseers, not by compulsion, but willingly, not for dishonest gain, but eagerly, nor as being lords over those entrusted to you, but being examples to the flock. And when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the crown of glory that does not fade away. Likewise, you younger people, submit yourself to your elders. Yes, all of you be submissive to one another and be clothed with humility for God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Therefore, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in due time, casting all your care upon him, for he cares for you. Verse 8, be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, walks about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. Resist him, steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same sufferings are experienced by your brotherhood in the world. But may the God of all grace, who called us 
to, to his eternal glory by Christ Jesus, after you have suffered a while, perfect, establish, strengthen, and settle you. To him be the glory and the dominion forever and ever. Amen. Amen. May God add a blessing to the reading and the hearing of his word. There is a lot there. But to sum it all up, there is a need for humility before God for the preacher pastor as well as for the congregant. The pastor has the most at stake because it is the pastor who must give an account, but that does not take members and officers who are members off the hook. We are the body of Christ. He died for us all, and we must all live before the unclouded mirror of the Holy Spirit. He knows, the Holy Spirit knows the mind, the motives, and the thoughts of everybody in the local church. As I close this sermon today, I do so with the words of David Bartlett, who studied this passage and rendered the following commentary on its contents. Bartlett says, and I quote, in a motion picture that seeks to make visible the reality and elusiveness of evil, one of the main characters says, quote, the devil's cleverest trick is this, to persuade people that he does not exist. Then he is free to do anything, unquote. However, however one seeks to understand the personality of evil, the reality of evil is an undeniable feature of the Christian understanding of the world. We do not have to deal with only human error or bad intentions or misfortunes. There are powers of evil that transcend both the individual actors and their actions. Racism is deeper and tougher than the sum total of people who display prejudice. Greed can be institutionalized and take on a life of its own. Sometimes the only viable description of the woes of the world is to say that evil is both real and strong. God, of course, is stronger, but Christians are still called and strengthened to engage in a genuine struggle with forces whose ultimate defeat we know, but who in the meantime are just as ravenous ambulatory and dangerous as the lion, First Peter, warns us to fear. The title of this message is, I Will Pray for My Church Leaders, and I hope you will. May God bless you, and may heaven smile upon you.